Okay, so here is where things start to get a little bit different, maybe a little bit more exciting. We have seen one basic application of integration. We've done a lot of area stuff. Area under the curve, area between two curves. Average value is kind of a curveball. It doesn't really fit in with all of these. The only way it fits in is that it's an application of integration. But the rest of the chapters are about area and now volume. 626364, six, the rest of them are all about volume. Um, and so rather than looking at these two-dimensional shapes and taking the area, we are creating three-dimensional shapes and then taking the volume. Okay, so we are looking at geometric formulas, sort of, that we know. And so if you think three-dimensional objects, we know how to find the volume of a cone. We know how to find the volume of a cylinder or, you know, a box, you know, something simple like that. But when we have these random three-dimensional shapes, like the couple different shapes that I'm showing you right here, we don't have a volume for that. We don't even know what this shape is or what this shape is. And so very, very similar to the idea of Riemann sums. With Riemann sums, we didn't know at first how to get the area under a curve. And so we started by what, what or started with what we do know, which is rectangles. And so we're going to start here with what we do know with like these little disc sort of shapes that we have here for that example. So we can do like cylinders, we could do boxes, like different shapes that we do know, and we can use those to approximate volume. All right, so that's the idea that we're starting with. So if we look at this one right here, you can see, so these, these two shapes are not meant to be the same. I'm just showing you kind of two funny looking volumes that we could find. All right, so this one right here, if you take this and slice it up, so now we're slicing it horizontally, so according to different y values, so we slice, 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 and then you have n different slices. We start at a and we end at b and we just slice it going all the way up. And so what they did, so these little dot, dot, dots here, they pulled out this slice right here. And hopefully you notice that that slice looks an awful lot like a short fat cylinder. And so we're gonna use the idea of a cylinder. It's not perfect, because if you look like this radius at the top is a little bit smaller than this radius at the bottom, just a little wider down here. But it's a cylinder-ish, which is good enough for us, because we're starting with an approximation. And then we're gonna come up with an actual formula using integration. So the volume of a cylinder, if you guys remember this, is pi r squared h. Hopefully that sounds familiar for the volume of a cylinder. And then if you're looking at this little shape, it's obviously not a perfect cylinder, like I said. But if we get thinner and thinner and thinner, each slice will almost be a perfect cylinder. And then we'll start to be able to approximate using definite integrals, just like we did with area under the curve. And so the volume of each little slice right here, okay? So we're going to start out with this. Pi r squared h, we're going to go back to this formula and then compare it back to what we have up here. All right, so we've got two different pieces. We've got this piece right here, the pi r squared part, and that's the area of a circle. Hopefully you recognize that. So the pi r squared, this part right here is the area of a circle. And then, whoops, this h part right here, that's the height of the cylinder. and we're gonna translate it in terms of the function and in terms of x and y. Okay, so this first piece right here that represents the area of a circle. So if you're looking at like the top, like just look at the two dimensional part right there, it would be like the area of that circle times the height of the rectangle. I'm sorry, times the height of the cylinder and that would give you the volume. So if we turn it into what we've got going on right here, this whole thing, since we're talking about the area of a circle, we are going to call this the area formula in terms of y. Okay, and the area is going to be given in terms of y because as you move up and down, as the y values change, the area of those circles are going to change. All right, so we call this the area, this time of a circle, but it could be the area of a square, the area of a triangle, or something like that. We'll get there. We're starting with circle examples. And then this little h is the height of each one of these, which is the change in y, like from this y value to this y value, or from this y value to this y value. So the height, we're gonna write delta y. Okay, so that's one example. One of those little slices will have this as a volume. Whatever area we're using, here we're using circles, like I said, eventually we'll move on to different shapes, and then times delta y. So we sum them all together. So here's what's gonna happen. Do you remember seeing this? That stands for the sum. 
And so the sum, we've got, we're summing up all of those little cylinders. So we add this one to this one to this one. We just keep on going. We add them all together. We have n of these. Um, so this picture looks like it might only have like eight or so. Um, so we could make it more accurate by having 10 or by having 20 or by having 50. And so what we do is as we go off to infinity, remember what happens is the sum becomes a definite integral and this delta y becomes a dy. Okay, so that's the sort of whole sum idea. Now let's start and talk about these approximations of integrals. And so this ends up becoming an integral, like I said, as delta y goes to zero and as the number of slices goes off to infinity, it becomes just like a definite integral. So if we have a cross section, if this is a of x, if it's taken perpendicular to the x-axis, that would be the opposite direction. So if we sliced it this way, if we sliced it up and down, then it would be in terms of x because you'd have like a delta x as you go from left to right. So this would be the area, you know, from a to b, I'm sorry, the integral from a to b, of an area function in terms of x, dx, but the one that we just looked at, we're slicing perpendicular to the y-axis, so we're slicing this way, which means we're slicing according to y value rather than according to x value. And so this one, now we always do c to d when we're talking about generic functions in terms of y, because we've always used a to b when we're talking about in terms of x. All right, so those are our formulas. Um, we are going to start talking about this example right here, and I'm going to cut the video, and I'm going to show you guys a little demo, this thing that I found on my computer years ago. Um, you'll see my really you know, advanced technology. <laughs> and hopefully, because people have a really difficult time visualizing what these solids even look like. Okay, So there's two very important things. First of all is the base that you're sitting on. So if you look at this problem right here, the base is bounded by this graph. And so that is this shape right here. This is a circle, x squared plus y squared. It's a circle centered at the origin. The 16 tells us that our radius is four. And so it's centered at the origin. We've got a radius of four. It's not flawless because I tried to make that sketch on my computer, so I apologize. But just pretend that they're hitting right at four and negative four all around. So this is our base right here. And then it's got square cross sections taken perpendicular to the x-axis. So what happens, and this is the visual, this is why I'm gonna show you guys this little demo. And so we're sitting here, and so perpendicular to the x-axis, so say like right here, if we draw a line right here, that base would be 8, because we go from positive 4 down to negative 4, so this would have a base of 8, and so it's going to be a square. And so squares, of course, have equal bases and heights, so this, from this point, we would rise up with a height of 8 units. So then say we go, you know, somewhere over here. If we go over here, that has a base of about 6. And so if this has a base of about 6, it would rise up to a height of 6. Same thing over here. This has this length of this base is about 6, so it would rise up to a height of 6. Because if you sliced into it, if we sliced into it going perpendicular to the x-axis this way, it would look like a square. And so if you look at these shapes right here, it's kind of hard to see, but you do have these little lines that are separating it. And notice right here, is where the base is the longest, which is when the height would be the tallest. You can see right down the middle is when this shape is the tallest. And then as it moves out towards the ends, its height is going towards zero, and that's because as you move out towards the ends here, the width of the, of the base would be going towards zero. So like I said, that's a really, really, really tricky thing for people to wrap their heads around. So I'm gonna pause right here, and then I'm going to try to uh, do a recording of my computer screen and hope that it doesn't look horrible. Okay, so we now jump to my super shaky, super sketchy video of this demonstration. So we've got a whole bunch of different models here, so they're all gonna have different bases. So I'm gonna look at this one right here, the semicircular cross sections of a solid. So the base is the square root, and so when I click on this demonstration, you'll be able to see the base, and then you see the cross sections are circles. And so it's gonna form this three-dimensional shape. So the base is the function root x from zero to nine, and then the cross sections are semicircles. So we are going to click on this and I will show you exactly what this does. Okay, oh, you can see me holding my iPad. Okay, so it's generating these semicircular cross sections. So as you move through, you can see this is the square root of x. And as you move from left to right across the x axis, these semicircles are popping up. And you know how tall the semicircle is going to be because you know how wide the semicircle is going to be. That's all based on the square root of x. 
Okay, so it makes this nice, beautiful, uh, weird three-dimensional shape. Kind of looks like a, you know, like a cornucopia or something. I think it's going to start over. There we go. So there's our base. There's the square root of x. And then here's the x-axis. So these semicircles are popping up. And of course, the more we added, the smoother it would look. Okay, so you see those popping up? It is generating a three-dimensional shape. All right, so I'm going to give you guys one more. Let me back it up here. Let's go back and pick a different one. You're welcome for the very high quality video, by the way. Let's see. Square cross sections sitting on an equilateral triangle. That would work. Ooh, no, this one looks interesting. Equilateral triangle sitting on sine. Okay, so let's look at this one. So here's a piece of a sine graph right there, and we are generating equilateral triangle cross sections. So you can see it's moving down the x-axis, and these equilateral triangles are popping up. So the wider the sine curve is, the taller those equilateral triangles are going to be. Okay, so they pop up until you've got what basically looks like, I don't know, a little like slice of a sphere, I guess, if you could slice a sphere up. Okay, so it generated them. Now let's watch it one more time. arch of sine. See, it's generating all of those triangle cross sections. Let's look at one different cross section, see what else they've got for us. Cross sections, ooh, sitting on a quarter of a circle. That's the most similar to the one we've got so far. Okay, let's look at this. So we're sitting on a quarter of a circle, and we're going to pop up these square cross sections. See, that one's the shortest, because the base that it's sitting on is, is the least wide, I guess, at this point. So now this one, it's got more and more and more squares. So you can see it's starting to be really smooth. This one has way, way, way more cross sections than the other one does. And so it's getting taller and taller, and that's because the piece of the semicircle that we're sitting on is getting wider. All right, so you can see it just forms this three-dimensional shape. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a good idea. I'm going to go back to that last example. Okay, so hopefully now you've got a visual of exactly where this three-dimensional shape on the left comes from. If I could make it pop up in front of you on the paper, I would, and if I could give you different colors, I promise I would do that as well. Um, so I'm doing, doing the best I can with this shape that we've got. So what we're gonna come up with is the area function itself, and that's the part that's tricky. So it's this part that we need to come up with. So they're always gonna tell you this, so taken perpendicular to the x-axis means that everything is going to be taken in terms of x. So your bounds are going to be from x value to x value. Your whole function is going to be written in terms of x. So here's what we do. So I want you to start with the area function. And it's going to be the area of whatever cross sections they give you. So like up here, the cross sections were circular. And so we use this. Pi r squared was the area of a circle. Here, we are taking the area of a square. So the area of a square is side squared, okay? Much like pi r squared, um, we're also going to know, you know, how to do a square, how to do a semicircle, how to do an equilateral triangle, things like that. So the area of a square is side squared. You're always going to start with that. All right, but now we have to come up with this a of x, which is an area function in terms of x, in terms of what they gave you right here, and that is all going to be based on this equation. Okay, so if we want to know what the side is, like here, the side length we said was about 6. Here, we know the side length is 8. If we go all the way to the end, the side length is 0. And so you can see the side length is constantly changing as x changes, which is why it's going to end up being a function of x. Okay? So here's the tricky part. This quote-unquote side that we're talking about is actually this value minus this value, which brings us back to the area stuff. And the area stuff tells us that upper minus lower gives us exactly what the side is. Okay, so this, I'm going to rearrange this. y is equal to plus or minus the square root of 16 minus x squared. Okay, so here I subtracted the x squared over and then square rooted. Don't forget your plus or minus. This top part right here is the positive square root. And then this bottom part right here is the negative square root. So if we want to find the area of this thing right here, we would do the top half, 16 minus x squared, minus the bottom half, which is a negative root 16 minus x squared. OK, 
Okay, so that's what we're looking at so far. Of course, we've got plus a positive, which ends up giving us 2 root 16 minus x squared. So that's the side length, and it works at any value of x. So here, for instance, I said this was 8. So if we plug in 0, because this is an x value of 0, if I plug in 0 right here, you can see it's 2 times the square root of 16, which is 8. And if you go all the way to the end at 4, our length is supposed to be 0. If you plug 4 in here, you can see you're going to get 0. You can also, also test out anything in between. Like if you plug in, you know, 2. If you plug in x is 2, you've got 2 root 12, whatever that turns out to be. You could plug in 3 and you'd have 2 root 7, whatever that turns out to be. So it's giving you the side length at any given time. Notice, whether you plug in positive 2 or negative 2, it's going to give you the same side length because you're squaring it, whether you plug in negative 4 or positive 4. So this gives you the side length at any given value of x. So hopefully that makes sense. Then we're just going to take this and plug it into our area formula. So our area formula in terms of x, the area of our cross-section is side squared, and we found an expression for side, so it's just... 2 root 16 minus x squared quantity squared. And we simplify that up, 16, I'm sorry, root 16 minus x squared. If we square it, we just get the quantity 16 minus x squared. And then if we square the 2, we get 4. Okay, so we simplify this up and we get 64 minus x squared. So if we wanted to know the area of one of these squares at any particular value of x, you would just plug it into this formula right here. So for example, if I plugged in 0, I would get 64, which should make sense because if I make a square out of this, it would be an 8 by 8 square. All right, so the last thing is I use this formula right here. So my volume is going to be the integral from, now I do my x values. My furthest x value over here is a negative 4. My last x value over here is a positive 4, and then I just plug in my area function. And I think we could probably do this in our calculators. I'm sure you wouldn't be too mad about that. Okay, so whether you've got an Inspire or an 83 or an 84, I'm going to do it with the Inspire, but I'm sure we know how to do this by now. So with the Inspire, we hit Menu, Calculus, Numerical Integral. We're going to go from negative 4 to 4, oops, 4, 64 minus x squared with respect to x. Okay, so about 469 and a third. Or, if you want to put it into a fraction, we've got 1408 divided by 3. Oops, I'm missing a piece here. Shoot, sorry. It's a 4, I forgot to distribute my 4. Let's try that again. There we go, that looks better. So approximate it to a fraction. So we've got 1024 over three. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so that's our answer for that one. We're gonna take a look at a couple more. So if we look at this next page, we have the base. Now the base is given to us in terms of functions, so we need to draw it. I am providing you with a little graph here. Now it's very, very important in this section, again, to draw your base. Because there's a lot of things that I'm gonna suggest you kind of sketch on here. Okay, so it's bounded by this and this. So we've got x plus one, and I gave you some pretty easy ones so we can see what they look like. Um, so we find their intersection points so that they know we know when they're gonna intersect. So we set x plus one equal to x squared minus one. Let's get everything on the right-hand side. Zero equals x squared minus x minus two. Okay, so factors down to x minus 2, x plus 1. So they intersect at 2 and negative 1. So if we plug in negative 1, they're right here on the x-axis. And then if we plug in 2, they're up here at 3. Okay, so we know exactly where they're intersecting. So they're both very easy to draw. So you can draw the x plus 1. It's got a y-intercept of 1 with a slope of 1. So there's our first graph. Okay, so it looks like that. That's the x plus 1. And then the x squared minus 1, we know it's got x-intercepts at positive 1 and negative 1. And then it's going to go through y-intercept of negative 1 and comes back up here. Okay, so if we're looking at that, the base is the area in between. So I'm going to shade that in just so we kind of get a visual of what our base is.
Okay, so that's our base. And then from that base, we're gonna have equilateral triangles which magically rise up. Okay, so I will give you this. The area of equilateral triangles, this is something that you should have memorized. If you've heard this before, wonderful. If not, here it is. So an equilateral triangle is root three over four times base squared. Um, this formula is based on the fact that because it's an equilateral triangle, um, it's a 60, 60, 60 triangle. And if you're looking at the one half base times height, you can figure out what the height is relative to the base. Um, it's all very geometric. I'd be happy to explain it to any of you if you're curious, but I promise you this is in fact the area of an equilateral triangle. We can't do any old triangle because we need formulas where the height is dependent upon the base. Because otherwise you would have no idea how high the shape is going to rise. That's why we can only do squares rather than rectangles. Because with a square, if you know how wide it is, you know how tall it's going to be. With a rectangle, it could be any height we wanted, which is why we don't do rectangles. So we've got this formula right here, and then the base is going to be given by you know, this right here, one of those area formulas, upper minus lower. So the base, if we are perpendicular to the x-axis, is going to be given by upper minus lower. Okay, so our base is the upper function, which is the x plus 1 minus the lower function, which is the x squared minus 1. Very careful with your like terms. Make sure you've got parentheses before you subtract. So when we combine these up, we get a negative x squared plus x plus 2. Okay, so that's our base. So if I wanted to know my base at any particular time, I could plug in the 0. I'm sorry, I could plug in the x. So say I plug in 0, jump the gun a little there. If I plugged in 0, I would get 2, which you can see this length would be 2 if I went at x equals 0. If I want it, x equals 1, also looks like that might be a height of 2. Yeah, if I plug in 1, I've got negative 1 plus 1 plus 2. And so you can see the height at any different value. Okay, so that's going to be the base. And then from that base, kind of rises an equilateral triangle, just like you saw in those demonstrations. Okay, so my area function in terms of x, we start with this. And this, we come up with this formula based on what they tell you the cross section is. And then we come up with this formula based on the bounds that we're talking about, okay? So we've got the root 3 over 4, and then base squared would be what we wrote down for the base squared. The reason we have a full formula is because as the x value changes, the base is going to change, which means the area of the triangle is going to change. Okay, so finally for my volume, I go in terms of x. So my first x value is this left intersection point, which is a negative 1. My ending x value is my second intersection point, which is x is 2. And then we just plug in this formula right here. Don't forget your dx. We need to have the dx every single time. Okay, so now I will plug this in. So we've got menu, calculus, numerical integral. So I'm going from negative 1 to 2. And I have a root 3 over 4 out front and then times this quantity squared. Okay, so that's exactly what I've got written down. This is all done with respect to x. And I get about 3.507. We are always going to at least three decimal place accuracy. Okay, so now let's look at one more. For example, three, we've got the same picture, but we are going to assume that the cross sections are semicircles. Okay, so for semicircles, the area that we're talking about is half of a circle, so one half times the base, I'm sorry, times pi r squared. So now here's where things get a little weird. Once we do this once, it's just going to be a formula that you can memorize. Now the radius is not what's given to us. If a semicircle were to rise out of this line, this would be the diameter, not the radius. Okay, so if we replace the radius, the radius is actually half of the diameter. So a lot of people try to make this a one-fourth because of this one-half, but this is actually a one-half quantity squared. So when I have one-half quantity squared times another one-half, we get one-eighth pi times the diameter squared. Okay, because this, like this solid black line that I drew in right here would not be a radius, it would be a diameter. 
Okay, so that's the area of a semicircle. We always start with the area of the cross section, and then we know what our base is. So now this time it's the diameter. The diameter is given by this same exact expression that I had up above. That is the upper minus lower based on my shape. And then I just plug it right in. So I have the same bounds because it's the same picture and they're the same functions. Okay, so we write that down. Now we could leave like the pi over 8 out front if you wanted to, so I'll show you what that would look like. So if we go from negative 1 to 2, if we just do this part in the integrand, then we can multiply the whole thing by pi later because that would give us an exact answer. So here we get 8.1. So if we do, well, that was just this piece, we get 1 8 pi times 8.1. Okay, and then you can simplify that up. So this would be, instead of 8.1 over 8, we can multiply both the pieces by 10, so you get 81 times pi over 80. Just so you don't have 8.1 over 8, because that's really messy. So this would be an exact answer. Um, if you wanted to just leave the pi over 8 right in the integrand, you could do that too. Let's make it a fraction. So we get about 3.181, okay, which you can see is the same as, as 81 pi over 80. All right, so we have some AP problems that we can look at um, when we have class.